Good afternoon. I am extremely pleased to be here today to present the second annual Westport Prize for Literature. This prize, which celebrates outstanding original works of fiction that explore issues in contemporary society, was originally conceived as a juried book award that has broad-based community participation. And it's especially fitting that the presentation of this award follows uh, what we've just had as a very moving tribute to Sybil Steinberg. I spoke to Sybil on the phone not long before she passed, and we talked about this award, and she had agreed to be part of our jury and was thrilled at the idea of a literary prize in Westport. She knew, as I do, that Westport is a community of voracious readers filled with avid fans of literary fiction and thoughtful takes on contemporary life. This year, we had a wonderful response to our call for readers from the community. About 40 people participated by reading and reviewing submissions. Too many to call out individually, but a huge collective thank you to the members um, of the community that helped us read the books. And I also want to thank uh, the members of our jury, book blogger and aggregator Suzanne Leopold, publishing industry veteran Erica Melnichok, uh, nonfiction writer and former Book of the Month Club judge Nina Senkovich and Charlotte Rogan, author of The Lifeboat, all fellow Westporters. Finally, thanks to my fellow steering committee members, Allison Hoffman, Maggie Mudd, and Patra Kanchanagam, and to the library staff who have worked with us to make this idea a reality. This award and its $10,000 prize is meant to support great literature and reflect and sustain the rich literary life of Westport. The prize winner this year is Freedom is a Feast by Alejandro Poyana. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the book is a multi-generational saga of love and revolution set in the author's native Venezuela. A recent review in the New York Times praised Mr. Poyana for squeezing, quote, adventure, even dark comedy from misery and horror, and called the book a passionate, indictment of Venezuelan strongman Hugo Chavez. This story, set in the upheavals of Venezuela over the last decades, makes the political personal and sheds light on a crisis that remains in the headlines. Mr. Piana is here with us today to accept the award and speak about his book, and he'll be signing books after in the Kamansky room right behind here. And so without further ado, uh, Alejandro Piano, please come up to accept the award. Congratulations. Wow, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Westport Library, to Candace, to uh, the award committee, uh, anybody that took the time to read the book, and thank you, everyone that's here. I am just uh, extremely honored. Um, as some of you might know, Venezuela is going through a lot. Uh, in the past few years, and even in the past few months, we uh, just had a very important election in July um, where millions of people came out to vote wanting a change, a change of years of oppression, uh, dictatorship, uh, hardships. Um, and the decision of the people in power was to uh, keep power um, and not not give room for this change. So the fact that the book is being honored in this way um, at this moment feels particularly special to me, uh, and I am so grateful for that. Um, I figured I would read a few pages of the book. Um, I'm going to read from, so the book takes place over the, about 50 years of Venezuelan history, starting in the 60s with the rise of the left in Venezuela and ending in 2012, 2013, when Chavez is dying of cancer. Um, it tries to tell the story, uh, the complex story of Venezuela and why we are in the moment that we are now. But it tells it through uh, the story of this family, um, that uh, a man and a woman that fall in love as guerrilla fighters in the 1960s in the jungles of Venezuela, um, and the political circumstances of the country tears them apart. And the book tries to answer the question 
of are we going to take the opportunities that life gives us to reconnect and to mend old wounds, even when the country itself seems to be conspiring against us. Um, so this scene that I'm gonna read uh, takes place in 1998. Uh, Hugo Chavez is running a historic election campaign. Um, the people are really behind him looking for a change uh, from, from years, especially poor people and working class people from years of being neglected. Um, and this is from the point of view of Emiliana, that um, young revolutionary that falls in love in the jungles. Um, she's a single mother now, and she has a grandson, Eloy. And, they are, and she's very sick with cancer, and it's her last chance to go cast a boat for somebody that she really believes in. Um, so we are, we are going out to vote with them at this moment. And so they move together in a chain, Eloy pulling his grandmother, his grandmother pulling her daughter. Emiliana was no longer disappointed that Maria wasn't more like her, but she was afraid, afraid that Maria wouldn't be strong enough to do things on her own after she died. The seniors line was long and hardly unusual, was moving more slowly, but eventually they made it through. Emiliana handed the man at the table her cédula de identidad and signed the election book. You're right, from he right here, the man said and presented her with the ink sponge. Emiliana pressed down that satisfying wetness and made her mark next to her name. The man gave her a ballot. Where does mine go, Eloy asked. Eloy is the grandson. The poll worker winked at Emiliana. We have a special book for first time voters, he said, and pulled a small notebook from a pack by his side. He opened it to a blank page. Write your name right here. Eloy wrote it carefully, tongue sticking out the side of his mouth. And now your thumb, please, sir, the man said. Eloy was ecstatic as he left his tiny imprint in the man's notebook. I voted, he yelled. No, honey, Emiliana said. Not yet. We're going to do that next. Eloy looked at him confused. Go, Eloy. Go with your abuela. Go vote. Maria shoved him gently and started filling out her own form. Emiliana and Eloy walked hand in hand to the booth. She showed Eloy the ballot, which depicted all the political parties, 36 in total, and the faces of the candidates the party supported. Why are there so many Chavez, Eloy said. Which one do we vote, do we vote for? Emiliana explained that each square represented a political party, and each party supported one candidate for president. So they were not just voting for president, but also for a political party. Mark right here on this one, she said, pointing to the MVR party square. Fill the circle nice and dark, okay? Eloy filled the bubble. Now we fold it like this, she said. You want to put it in the box? Yes. They exited the booth and walked to the ballot box. Emiliana picked Eloy up. She hadn't done it in months and was surprised, thankful, that she still could. Eloy slipped the folded ballot in the slot on his first try. When he looked at her, Emiliana thought she would be blinded. He lit up so bright. Now we dip our pinkies, she said. Eloy was confused again. What? Emiliana pointed to the poll workers, making sure everyone dipped their pinky fingers in ink. It's the last step, she said. So everyone knows you voted, and you can't go vote again somewhere else. It keeps everything fair. Emiliana dipped her finger, and Eloy did the same. His fingernail turned a deep blue, almost black. You did it, Emiliana said, and embraced him. His little legs hugged her torso, and he nuzzled his face in her neck. She inhaled, took him in, hugged him so tight. She hoped this wouldn't be the last time she could hold him like this, but she didn't know. So she let the moment last as long as her arms would allow. Thank you. Um, I, like, I like that scene a lot. Emiliana became my favorite character. She was a late character to the book, actually. 
Um, she didn't have any point of view sections for a very long time, um, and through the editing process, uh, she was always a character that I loved so much. Um, and when we knew, when I knew that um, I was really going to explore what Chavez meant to people at that time and what his regime later became, um, I knew that I had to give her a louder voice. Um, and in a time where we're, we just had elections in Venezuela and we've got elections coming uh, up here, I just felt it was, a, it was an important piece to read. Um, the book came about in a very different way. For me, the origin of the novel, um, I started writing it about 10 years ago. Uh, when my brother was in his uh, early 20s, I already lived in the United States. I had come to Austin to do a master's degree at that time in advertising. I wasn't a writer yet. Um, and my brother was kidnapped back home uh, for the second time, actually, when he was in his 20s. Um, he was held hostage by, by some criminals, and um, uh, it took many hours of police negotiations. And thankfully, my brother was okay after, after going through a very bad ordeal. And when, when he called me later that night to explain to me what had happened, um, I was so shocked and saddened and frightened for him and, and for my family and for what could have happened. Um, but part of his story really um, surprised me. Uh, during his time uh, being held, him and one of the men, that one of the criminals that was there, sat down and had a really long conversation. Uh, the man was very apologetic, uh, very ashamed. Um, he told my brother he had never done anything like this. Um, and uh, that part of his story really moved me and stayed with me for a long time. Um, at that same moment, I was wrestling with my own identity in Austin. Um, I missed Venezuela tremendously, but I also felt angry at, um, at the country, at the state that it was in. I feel like I was slowly removing myself from the life of the country after being really obsessed about everything that was going on. Um, I was hitting a stage where I just couldn't pay attention, couldn't hear anything that was going on back home. And this story eventually led me back to it. Um, a few years after it happened, I started writing about that experience that my brother had, and I wrote it from the point of view of the kidnapper, I think as a way to try to understand uh, why a man would do something like that, uh, a man that apparently, you know, had never done it before and all these things. And that was the entry point for this book. I, I, I used it, I started with Aloy as a young man, um, and then the book exploded from there and it allowed me to try to wrestle with my own identity as a Venezuelan, uh, wrestle with my own identity as a writer. Um, and now it's here, and I'm so thankful for everyone that's here to, uh, to read it, um, to uh, share it with your friends and loved ones, uh, and to learn a little bit more about the country that I love through these characters that I hope you get to love as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.